Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I think we're going to get started. Um, thank you for coming to the second day of Signs of Artificial Life, um, which is configured as a conversation between our two uh, prestigious guests, Terrence W. Deacon and Anne Catherine Hales. Um, I uh, we we are going to conduct this mainly as as a conversation, um, but I have the expectation that. There will be a few people, I see a few people in the physical audience. Um, I imagine there are a few on Zoom who couldn't make it for one reason or another yesterday and who uh, are here with us today. So I wanted to uh, begin, and the way we're gonna do this is like, we'll talk for, we're not 100% sure, maybe 45 minutes up to an hour uh, up here on the, on the uh, panel. And then we'll open it up for questions from both audiences. Um, if you're in the, the virtual audience, there's a Q&A function. I'll try to monitor that to the best of my ability. Um, but uh, I wanted to just begin by, I'm not going to reintroduce everybody. I'm Leif Weatherby. I mean, I will, but just very briefly. I'm Leif Weatherby. I'm in the German department here at NYU. I direct the digital theory lab. Uh, Jerry Deacon is, is uh, at, at Berkeley, an eminent uh, anthropologist, neuroscientist, philosopher. I'm not going to list all the different disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, Kate Hales is uh, 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 one of the most influential people in English and liter literary studies thinking about uh, machines and the question of machines and cognition. And the hook for this for me was, and this really was, I said this sort of tongue in cheek yesterday, but it really was true. I, I was reading uh, 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 Kate's wonderful article, which is called, Can Computers Create Meaning? And I noticed a few footnotes to Terrence Deacon's work. And I thought to myself, hey, here's a conversation that has the following counterintuitive shape. Terrence Deacon has been arguing for a long time that artificially intelligent systems are not intelligent at all on semiotic grounds. And here's Kate Hale's in Critical Inquiry saying, oh, maybe they are intelligent. So here's the literary scholar saying, I think these machines might have something going for them. And here's the 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 AI guy, you know, kind of Weizenbaum style saying, I don't know about that. Let's pump the brakes. And that was kind of the hook for me. I thought these two should be in conversation. And then they graciously agreed to join us. So we saw yesterday too, I mean, that was, I said uh, afterwards, I think that was the best double header I've ever seen in the academy. Um, just two magisterial talks, um, really, really impressive. I did not ask for them to both focus on GPT systems. You don't have to ask anyone to focus on GPT systems right now. Um, yeah, you know, you can't have breakfast without talking about GPT <laughs> systems right now. So, it was, but it was good that we dug in so deep. And I thought we would start right there with the paper. So we saw uh, Kate give an incredible uh, summary of her views on how literary scholarship and literary reading techniques have to become central to the evaluation of the question of intelligence itself in these AI systems, but also to, uh, in general, questions of textuality in an altered textual world, since we have pretty much entered that already. And the feeling is we're at the very beginning of something that could be, it could accelerate, basically, right? Um, and then we saw Terry give a, a, a summary of various aspects of his work, starting with the premise that GPT systems are sort of like uh, they, they mimic aspects of a certain kind of sort of brain damaged or psychologically, oh, yes, you right. know, uh, 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 pathological symptoms in certain human beings that have amazing linguistic abilities, but they are ungrounded in a certain way, visually and in otherwise, otherwise with respect to the truth. And this argument about ungroundedness was then unrolled over a, a, a beautiful reading of Charles Sanders Peirce's notions of the icon, the index, and the symbol with the idea that we have misread the symbol altogether, that the computer science, the Fragian notion of the symbol is just missing something about how it actually conveys meaning through a process of grounding, which by the end had something to do with the metabolism of the body and the way in which the brain uh, regulates temperature and uh, uh, blood flow within the brain. I may come back to that. I still have a bunch of questions about that. <laughs> sure. um, but. The first thing, I was, so I just wanted to sort of give my impression as a, as a summary of that for those especially who, who, who couldn't join us yesterday, and then to ask each of you to respond to the other one to begin, um, 
And I thought, um, uh, Kate, if you would be willing to start, um, yeah. I'm, I'd be really interested to hear what you thought, what kind of thoughts were triggered for you by Terry's paper, and then we'll go back and forth and we'll see where it takes us. Yeah, that's great. And I'm so happy that this is not uh, billed as a debate because I'm sure I would lose. But in any <laughs> event, uh, I wanted to unfold as a conversation where we're sharing ideas and hopefully by the end we're more enlightened uh, in general than than each of us, where each of us began. So um, I, of course, want to resist a little bit Terry's conclusion at the end that uh, because of its ungroundedness, these uh, intelligent systems will never achieve sentience and that uh, its uh, capability for meaning production is essentially zero for some, somewhat the same set of reasons. So um, I was uh, puzzled by an assertion that Terry made in a couple of papers he published about the nature of information, which incidentally are brilliant. But in that, uh, in those two papers, he makes an assertion that um, only indexical functions allow the direct imparting of information. He says icons allow uh, us to acquire information. Symbols allow us to create relationships between uh, different kinds of sign functions, but only the indexical uh, directly imparts information. To me, this is all the more central because of a wonderful article that uh, Leap published with uh, one of his graduate students about the indexical nature of AI. So Leap was arguing essentially that some of AI's indexical functions are mistaken to be iconic rather than indexical, but uh, made a very convincing argument that if you look into the architecture of these transformer large language models, you'll see that they are entirely indexical almost from start to finish. So that makes the idea that the indexical is the way that we directly acquire information all the more important because these are essentially indexical machines. Now, to a certain extent, I uh, agree with Harry's argument about the ungroundedness of the outputs of these machines. They have, as I like to say, they do not have a model of the world. They only have a model of language. And that means that for me, uh, in all of their productions, we will be able to see uh, what I call a systemic fragility of reference. That is, they'll make statements which are in variance to our direct knowledge of the world. Leaf mentions a famous article uh, from GP2, I think it was, that uh, was written as a scientific article about a valley where unicorns live. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was located in this imaginary, but nevertheless uh, literarily important uh, idea of a fantasy world, but uh, one uh, statement in that uh, simulation of a scientific article was widely noted and ridiculed, and that is somewhere the program talks about the unicorns with four horns, and the fact that it mistook a unicorn as a four-horned animal rather than the one-horned animal we all know from fantasy novels, uh, was a sign of what I call its fragility of reference, that uh, because it only has these linguistic knowledge of the world, no real physical immediate knowledge of the world, it, it regularly makes mistakes of, these of this kind. So to that extent, I, I agree with Terry's uh, assessment. Where I depart, I think, is uh, in the idea that the language model cannot learn anything about the world through the billions of human texts that it's read. Uh, it is obviously making inferences from these uh, many, many billions of texts. So it knows about what humans think about the world. It doesn't necessarily know about the world directly. And this uh, can be seen, I think, in its ability to replicate the style of any kind of writing because it knows the originals of that style and it can replicate it. Uh, and it can also detect genre near even higher level uh, of 
literary, comp a literary comprehension. So um, what my argument would be is uh, that it does in fact make inferences from the networks it constructs between indexical pointers. And that these inferences uh, largely correspond with what we see in human text, sometimes depart from it because it has no experience of the world. The network of inferences don't include any physical components. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I would imagine that these networks of inferences are constructed from the indexical pointers and then generalized in various kinds of ways, such that, for example, GPT-3 can imitate style. It can uh, detect and imitate genre. Genre can be thought of as the rules that allow a certain universe to come into existence. So the genre of fantasy novels, for example, locates you in a certain kind of universe. Uh, the genre of detective novels locates you in a very different kind of universe. But genre in general corresponds to the rules that underlie these different kinds of fictional universes uh, that writers write about. So uh, another aspect of Terry's argument that I am curious about is, uh, and correct me if I misunderstood you on this, but I thought you said that um, intelligence requires recursivity and that- uh, Not quite. Not quite. But okay. Symbols well, allow recursivity. So okay, yes. symbols allow recursivity. Um, but in fact, there are a lot, there is a lot of recursivity in the architecture of these neural nets. Mm -hmm. uh, Self-attention is one mode of uh, that kind of recursivity, that propagation uh, where the results of the first pass through are fed back into the machine and generated another uh, refinement of the first uh, output and so forth is another form of recursivity. Now it's true that uh, when we think about recursivity, and this is the part Leap was referring to at the end of Terry's talk, where he was talking about the um, in recruitment of the entire frontal cortex, for example, to understand a linguistic text. And I, I think his point is the same point that uh, Lawrence Barcelo made in his article, Grounded Cognition, that all of these uh, comprehension of mental abstractions, in fact, have a simulation corollary in the brain where uh, the recollection of a motor movement, for example, is fed it, uh, into the comprehension of something like listening to uh, a piano concerto. So it's been demonstrated that for a pianist to recognize his particular rendering of that piano concerto requires a simulation in the brain uh, where he simulates the movements involved in playing that piece and that's the only way he can identify his version of the piano concerto from another pianist piano concerto. So there's a lot of evidence indicating that there are motor components to what we might think of as otherwise abstract uh, abstract comprehension. And uh, in, in that respect, I think we could say that artificial neural nets have a simulation of that kind of feedback, but it's not from motor movements, it's from the recursive comprehension of a lot of other texts. So rather than referring to physical, uh, physical mechanisms within the body that accompany the comprehension of an abstract thought, the net is referring to its previous inferential network to, uh, well, what could we call it? I need a phrase for this, but it's like you ground yourself by other parts that are not also grounded. You might call this a kind of um, balancing act, a sort of pulling yourself up by your own boot, boot heels. The idea that uh, somehow you're grounding yourself against previously previous set of inferences, which themselves are not grounded, but that work with those inferences to widen the net of comprehension. That I don't, I don't, I'll need to have a phrase for that to describe that more succinctly, but that's the kind of idea that, uh, that I have in mind. So I'll 
I'll turn it over to Terry now, but I'll just accompany this by uh, a set of questions that you may uh, want to respond to. Firstly, um, please explain, if you can, uh, to me and to the audience, uh, why you think uh, indexicals directly give us access to information. So that would be my, my first question for you. Second question, what do you, how would you respond to the idea that the neural nets are creating networks of inferences that themselves rely on previous networks of inferences and so forth? This sort of grounding, not through direct connection with the physical world, but grounding through previous inferences that it's already made. And then uh, thirdly, uh, there are already experiments well underway where uh, these uh, computational neural nets are be connect being connected up with mobile robots. And this allows a sensory dimension and a sensory experience of the world similar to that experienced by humans. That is, it involves motor movements, it involves moving around physically in an environment, using those movements and so forth as the equivalent of physical inputs for humans, but, but mediated through a mobile robot. So uh, what do you think of that as expanding the groundedness, if right. you will, of, uh, of future neural nets through, uh, through robotic accessories uh, and that sort of thing? And then, uh, yeah. And can you explain why you think um, that, Oh, here, here's another statement that Terry made yesterday that I'd like a comment on. You said that uh, neural nets will never achieve sentience because they don't have involvement with a body. Uh, but my contention is that they, in fact, do have extensive uh, connection with the body, but it's not a human body. It's a body uh, that at present has no sensory organs, but in the future certainly will have sensory organs. And that uh, it involves a lot of recursivity through the kind of body it has. So GPT-3, for example, has 96 different layers of neurons. And that means that it has uh, an input layer that can be directly accessed by uh, someone in conversation with it. It has an output layer, which also is accessible. But if you have 96 layers of neurons, that means you have uh, one or two input layers, one or two output layers, and then something like 90 layers that are not accessible and uh, that are called the latent space. The latent space, because you can only make inferences about the connections between those neurons in those 90 some layers, you only have access to the direct access to the input and output layers. And so to find out something about what's going on in those 90 interior layers, you need to probe through carefully orchestrated uh, forays with the input and output layers in, in order to make inferences about what's in those inaccessible 90 some layers. So I'll turn it over to Terry Dowd. Uh, welcome any of your thoughts on this. All right, I won't remember all four of your questions, so we'll have to cycle okay, back. Okay, that's that. great. So, uh, what I learned yesterday um, was the very significant difference between somebody who looks at this from a literary human, humanist point of view and my own view, which looks at the same phenomenon um, from a materialist point of view. From the point of view of a biologist and a, a neurobiologist and, and somebody studying the evolution of life. Um, and our views are in parallel in most respects and yet represent, I think, still this Cartesian difference. And I want to see if I can lay this out. I, I uh, titled my talk in the shadow of Descartes. And the idea was that um, we have trouble thinking outside of this idea that there's the material and there's the cognitive and that somehow the cognitive is where we, we stand. And as human beings, we have a little thing that links these two together. Descartes thought it was the pineal body that linked together the, the thought part of the world and the physical world. Uh, and when we think about computing, I think we fall into the same trap. I think we haven't escaped Descartes' shadow in this respect. And what I mean by that is that um, 
when we look at something that comes back to us that looks like what we've produced, um, we are convinced that it must be produced in the way that we've done it and that it carries meaning. The first thing I want to say is that meaning is not in the things in the world. Reference is not in the things in the world. Reference is about something present and something absent. So in all the sounds I'm making right now, um, they are ungrounded to the extent that what they refer to um, is not present. It's not something right here that we can grab our hands on, nor is it the activity in my brain or the activity in your brain. Um, each of those are analogous to the sound. That is, they're just physical processes. The question is, why do they carry reference to something that's not, not present, something absent? What's this relationship to absence? Um, and that's where we get, get caught up. Uh, so here's what I want to say. First of all, the first thing we need to do is to rethink the concept of information, because we're stuck in thinking of information like Descartes thought about it. Um, and ultimately, throughout the 20th century, we have progressively expanded that distinction, um, even though we want to have a correspondence between the information in the world. So we have concepts like truth, for example, that talk about, well, that's a good correspondence, and then there's a bad correspondence possible. Um, but again, notice that we've still got these two worlds, and we've got something that links them together. The real problem is that they're not two worlds. They're one world. And they are linked together. And in fact, the information part of the world emerged from the physical part of the world. If you think about the evolution of life, before there was life, there was no aboutness. Before there were people, there was no justice. These are things that emerge, but they emerge from a physical process. So the real question is, how do we put this back together? How do we not get caught up? Now, from a humanistic point of view, I think there's a great deal to be learned from this. And I think that um, your presentation really brought it to me very clearly that one thing that we can do that we've not been able to do in the past in the humanities is do a very sophisticated job of actually identifying and maybe even me measuring where we are in a gender, in a, in, a, in, a, in a space of generic types of styles of genres and so on. Um, I think these techniques, because they capture so many dimensions and figure out a kind of the, the iconism that holds together a genre, um, we have in our hands now a capacity to do it in a quantitative and precise way using these technologies. Now, that might be a threat to those in liter literary world, but I think it's actually a tool that will be used in the, in the future a lot. So I think that there's a great deal to learn from that. But what we're doing, of course, is taking advantage of something that's grabbed huge quantities of real human communications, looked at the structure, not the reference, but looked at the structure of it and said, um, you can now parse the structure in different ways. You can use that structure to do different things. I tried to make this clear by also showing that the same architecture the GPT architecture has been used to generate protein structures from simple amino acid knowledge. That is, we have 20 amino acids. They just gave letters to each amino acid. There's 26 letters, 20 amino acids is pretty easy to do. And say, OK, string them together and ask the question, see how they're strung together in some proteins that we understand. Now let's just see if we can produce other proteins. And it turns out we now have knowledge of millions of different proteins. Um, that would not have been understandable without this. What it did is it looked at something in the world that has structure. That structure was determined by a bunch of physical processes in the world. Those physical processes structure proteins. We still don't, even though we have the knowledge of all those protein structures, we still don't know how they are put together. But the GPT architecture allowed us to say, okay, um, huge amount of information with no information about the physics. The physics is just sort of implicitly a trace behind all of this. Nevertheless, by virtue of using this technology, it found the structure. We can now use that information to study proteins that we've never studied before. We can in fact use that information to figure out how the physics actually produces those proteins. 
something we still don't know. But now that we have all of these models, we can now say, okay, here's my hypothesis. Let me use that purely correlative knowledge, that ungrounded knowledge in which the physics is there in a sense uh, indirectly. The physics produced the corpus from which this structure was taken, but the physics is not in it. But we can use that structure to now go back and discover the physics. I want to suggest that there's an analogy, I think, with the literary world uh, in which we can use it. Now, I also showed some pictures generated um, of actual painting-like structures, also generated not quite with the same architecture, but very similar architecture. And um, it does something similar. It grabs this huge amount of information, uh, in fact, of different painters, and then um, knowledge of words and phrases and descriptions and tries to fuse these together. Um, also producing, I think, remarkable artwork. I think we'll learn a lot about that by virtue of studying that process. So, so I think these are incredible tools for us. Not that it's gonna take over what we do, but we're gonna be using these tools because they give us a piece of information that we didn't have before. As we understand now the structure of these domains, even if we don't understand how they're put together. Think about language itself. We have lots of theories about how language works. You can go to the library and look at volume after volume of people trying to explain what are the rules that run it in different languages. Um, there's still lots of questions unanswered. Nevertheless, we can now begin to use these techniques to sort of probe that. So from the, the point of view of just accepting it, not trying to analyze how it works, um, I think there's tremendous power in these technologies. Um, and I think it will be used for you know, advantage in the academic world and disadvantage in other realms that people have talked about, of course, simulations and so on. Um, I have a problem with the word, not just information, but also with the word intelligence. Um, and what I began my talk with also is to say, we should stop calling it artificial intelligence and calling it, call it simulated intelligence. It's not, we don't call a model of how the, the galaxy formed and how stars interact with each other to pr produce this. We don't call it artificial galaxies or artificial physics. We call it a simulation. This is a simulation in the same sense. Um, our language is keeping us in the realm of Descartes by doing this. We're assuming what the Turing test thought it was showing us, that somehow the machine's getting more intelligent. No, what's happening is it's getting, we're more easily fooled. The more complicated it is, the more easily we're fooled into thinking there's a somebody there, there's a thought there. Um, so the first thing I want to say is how I began also yesterday, and that is that every machine is a potential computer. And that includes the engine in your car. What makes it a computer is not the machine. It's how we assign values to it that we can interpret in some kind of mathematical or linguistic form or protein structure or whatever. And what we do is we structure the machine so that it makes a good simulation of how that would happen for us. But what's happening is that we're taking the assignment that we've given to it and now assume that that relationship, that the aboutness relationship is somehow in the machine. It's not in the machine. It's between us and the machine. That doesn't mean, as I tried to say a few minutes ago, that it doesn't provide us with incredible new knowledge of the world. It does. The world of language, the world of literature and so on. I think it's a really powerful tool. Um, now, the question is, what about how it does this? Number one, if you look at billions and billions of human communications, there's structure there. There's structure that we don't see because it's dispersed in these millions of communications, but they have a sophisticated relationship to each other. And these machines accumulate all of this information, analyze it with thousands or more of dimensions of correlation give us an incredible piece of information as a result. 
in this process, one of the things that's happening is that we are, in a sense, um, using, like, like the case with the amino acids and proteins, we're using the structure of something. That we already know some of the structure. The structure has been given to that, that our communications have inherited our meanings without having any meanings there because the meanings have biased and structured the communications. But the communications are now there so that what, what's happened is the GPT system has inherited the structure, but not the meaning any longer. The meaning has been lost. And this is why I call it ungrounded. The question about grounding now, and is there somebody there, that question, you know, who's home, so to speak. Um, I've tried to argue that in fact, we know a lot about our own process of building symbol systems. Symbol systems by themselves can be treated as completely ungrounded. So think about um, logic, symbolic logic. Um, you don't have to have meaning. You can show inference, truth value, false value, and so on. Um, just by taking away all the meaning and having A's, B's, C's, and D's in algebra, in place, place for the meaning values. Um, because the structure is telling us something. The structure is important. Um, what's happened there, the, however, is that we can now say that if this is the structure for a valid argument, now if I plug in actual reference, I can know whether it's gonna actually handle that reference correctly, whether it's gonna give me a true inference or not. Now, let me go back to the concept of inference. Because I don't think that these machines do inference. Not only that, I don't think they're recursive either. And this is what I want to get to, because what's actually happening, again, think about it not as a, a machine that is intractable. We have no idea how it's working. But think about simple clockwork. Simple clockwork can have circular possibilities. Or something over here turns something over here, turns a gear over here, turns a gear over here, which influences this gear over here. That is, you can have circular relationships that are mechanical relationships. And mechanical relationships now can look like if I assign each of those steps, I assign them a symbolic value, it can look like a recursion. And so one of the real challenges with this is this, is this idea that um, that we look at the assignments of the physics that we've given, and we interpret that it's in the mechanical process. The real challenge is to now recognize that no, in fact, things are the other way around. And by that, let's go back to the evolutionary perspective. And that is the physical world has produced more and more information processing systems. We're um, an extreme example of it. But I think all of life is in one way or another dealing with the problem of self. We talk about self-reproduction, self-repair, um, benefits, costs. Chemistry and physics has no benefits and costs. There is no good chemistry or bad chemistry except with respect to life and what we want. There is no right chemistry or wrong chemistry, or no right physics or wrong physics. But as soon as there is a self, even a virus, we've been involved in trying to kill a virus, so to speak, stop it from doing what it does like a living system. Um, that tells us that it has a different kind of physics and chemistry. All life has normative features. That's because it has a self. The question is, does GPT, does my computer, does any piece of software have a self? Would it have a self? How does that come about? We have a clue by looking at life because living systems generate self. How do they do that? They do it by a curious loop, a kind of recursion, but it's a recursion in which the physical process produces constraints or structures that affect that physical process. Everything a bacterium does is about <clears throat> itself, about its existence, about maintaining its existence. So there's this strange loop. I like to call it an epistemology ontology loop. 
That is the epistemology that the, the aboutness relationship is ultimately about its own physicality. Because that physicality is entangled with the world and dependent upon the world, it's also carrying information about the world. But it's information that's not just structured. It's information that's now got costs and benefits. It's information about self versus other, self alive, self no longer existing. Um, that's at the very basis of life. The question is, in what sense can a device that we've built have that kind of relationship? I think they can. I think it's possible um, by virtue of having um, a process in which the physicality is what it's about. Under those circumstances, because I'm physically in the world, my continued existence depends upon being in the world and being in interaction, eating things, breathing things, and so on. Um, necessarily, the structure of the world matters. It has to be internalized to some extent. That structure is not just any old structure, and it's not just picking up any pattern in the world. It's picking up patterns in the world that matter to my physicality. That's why we oftentimes use the term embodiment to talk about this. Computing has no embodiment in a different sense. It's not that it's not physical. It is a machine, like, like clockwork is. But it's not about its embodiment. It has no link to its own embodiment. In fact, what we've done with computers is do what we do with every tool. We've make it, made it as distinguished from its own embodiment as we possibly can. We give it energy. We make it out of materials that don't degrade, that stay put. We don't build shovels to think. We build shovels because they, they stay the way they are, because they're separate. It's a tool. And for that reason, we built it in a way that has actually recapitulated the Cartesian story, where we have a physicality, and it's not involved in its own physicality. Because of that, I think it can't be sentient. To be sentient, to sense, to be linked to the world is not just to get pattern. And I think robots only just get pattern because for the most part, they're not in a sense continually maintaining and rebuilding themselves. There's little tricks that we can do to give a little bit of that, but because mostly they're built and made of things that are not dependent on the world, that are not far from equilibrium and basically trying to spontaneously destroy themselves, which every living thing ultimately is falling apart constantly, and we have to keep it, keep running fast to keep it going. Terry, can I can I pose a question just on this point? Yep. And I I, I think I want to give it back to to you, yes. Katie, because I think there's something. This is the crux of the debate that you just hit on at the at the at yes. the end of this extremely illuminating uh, 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 set of sequence of thoughts. But I think one of the things that I'm I I'm, I, I I feel like extremely privilege to be in this conversation because it doesn't have the, a characteristic which I really don't like about so much talk about AI, which is something that I think of as like, I call it remainder humanism. Like, <laughs> you know, everybody, this recoiling gesture, you know, like I have, uh, I'm not going to pin this on anybody in particular in the present world, but I, you know, I have colleagues who went through the entire death of the author sequence that, that Kate laid out yesterday and and, and think texts are not really about authors and so on. And then they see an AI generated text and they go, well, yeah, okay, but that's not poetry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a, for me, that's a form of humanism that shouldn't, doesn't really belong where it, where it, where it lives. And it comes for me in the AI discourse from Hubert Dreyfus. Yes. Because Dreyfus says just a little bit, you kind of came back to it, you know, computers are not in the context. They don't, they can't do something because they're not in their own world in a certain sense. And it is this Heideggerian point that he's making. It's very clear. And, and it's a line of thinking that is endemic to AI critique, which puts the difference between machines and humans before the analysis. And the thing that I love about this conversation is that no one is doing that. So you're building up to a difference, which you're locating in a very, you know, like very particular material layout and, and so on. 
And and Kate, my my understanding is that you you disagree with this this particular point. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, well, I find this conversation fascinating because it uh, really does bring out the absolutely salient points. But um, so I've argued that uh, the relation of humans and computers has a chiastic structure. So a chiastic structure in rhetoric is where you have a certain proposition and then it's inverted in the second half of the sentence uh, to form a kind of inversion, as it were. So if you think about the relation of humans and computers from the beginning uh, to the present, you could detect in them a chiastic pattern. And the chiastic pattern goes like this. From the very beginning, biological organisms were immersed in their environment. They had to be immersed in their environment in order not to die. That's the point you make about falling apart all the time. Mm -hmm. So they had to have mechanisms that connected them to the environment that allows them to stop their entropic decay and continue to survive. So Darwin phrased that uh, survive and reproduce, that the biological mandate all biological organisms follow is you survive and reproduce. Then uh, if you're successful, then you get a new generation and that mutates and so on and so forth. And finally you get from an amoeba to a human. So the human like the amoeba has the biological mandate to survive and reproduce, but it's now refined that survival and intervened in that sur survival in uh, so many ways that it's now able to go from immersion in the environment to abstraction mm -hmm. in the environment. It, for example, the evolution of the symbolic species, as Terry argued in, uh, in his book. You think about computers, computers start from design and purpose. That's their mandate. They don't start from survival uh, and reproduction. They start from design and purpose. That makes them extrinsic, intrins, extrinsically oriented. That is, they're not about their own survival. They're about mandating, uh, fulfilling whatever their mandate is for the people who create that uh, particular computer. But as they evolve, uh, they go from uh, an abstraction into an increasing immersion into the environment. And they do that by expanding the realm of um, sensor, sensors and actuators. So now you have computers that have various ways to sense their environment, to act upon their environment, so that you now have a chiastic structure from the biological organisms and the humans. The humans start with immersion, work up to abstraction. Computers start with abstraction, work up to immersion. So they cross. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one more way. Um, so I'm just trying to uh, think about the other embodiment uh, argument. Um, they also have a chiastic structure in uh, in another sense as well, uh, besides immersion. <clears throat> I can't immediately call that to mind, so let's just go with the immersion kind of environment. Oh yeah, so computers start uh, with an extrinsic mandate, but they can increasingly work up to an argument about their own survival. Let us say, taking picking up on Terry's point, how would you give a, a computer with some kind of mechanism that attaches it to the world that gives it a survival and reproduction instinct? Mm -hmm. Okay, say that you have uh, all, all computations uh, produce heat. They produce heat even though they're using transistors. So you they uh, going from a uh, transistor to going from vacuum tubes to transistors is a huge reduction in the amount of heat produced, but they still produce heat. So that's why you have server farms located in right. Iceland, for example, because you want to be able to dissipate the huge amount of heat generated by these huge computational structures. So now you build into the computer a mandate to minimize and continue its production of heat. Now you've created uh, a loop between its actual effects in the world and what it is designed uh, to do. So now you make its purpose uh, to continue 
the uh, production of heat in a way that minimizes its impact on the environment. So now you've created a loop where, in effect, the computer wants to survive and reproduce, not in the way that biological organisms do, but in the way that its own physical processes have been linked to the continuation of the kind of computation it does. You've now given an equivalent to survive and reproduce by, go, by tracing that same loop from beginning with abstraction going through immersion. So you've created a loop where you've now kind of artificially given it an equivalent to the biological mandate by circling through its own mandate, which is design and purpose. So one of the things that troubles me in all this is we talk about its mandate, talk about um, its purpose. These are not its purpose. No, um, we can we can produce circularity so I can produce even a clockwork that cleans itself of of dust or um, cleans itself so that it you know it keeps itself gears well oiled and so on and so forth um, but it's not its purpose the question is how does something have an it a self in this case we're talking as though this has a self the question is, what is the nature of that self? And I don't think it's just this circularity. But what I meant was that the very notion of information, the very notion of the differences that it produces um, are about intrinsically, the first kind of aboutness has to be about itself. So I actually, I would disagree with this sort of chiasmatic notion that you have here, this crossing notion. Um, because I, I don't think that it's ever the case that we can do that these devices, unless their initial sources of information are about itself. But yeah, that's but what it builds up. Why do they have to be? Oh, I, because you're assuming that biological evolution has to be replicated in technological evolution. That's a false analogy. There's no reason why it has to acquire a self in the same way that biological systems acquired a self. It can acquire a self in a quite different way. And in fact, that brings up another point I'd like to make, not that you do this, but many people do this. Uh, and that is to assume that sentience has to take the same kind of form that it takes in biological organisms. That's, there's no requirement that uh, that be the case. For example, biological organisms evolve through generations. So you have a, a kind of a mandated period of, let's say, on average 20 years that makes any mutation possible. So it's tied to the rhythm of biological organizations. But technological evolution isn't tied to generational time scales. It can go through generations in a microsecond. So that means that it is progressing along a quite different pathway than biological evolution, simply along the temporal dimension. But I, I could make the same kind of argument about many other differences between biological and technological evolution. Can I ask a quick question about this? Just, yeah. just I mean, I, I think that uh, the way that this, this particular axis of the slight disagreement here came out yesterday in the talks for me, was on a slide that you showed us, Terry, that was, um, the slide was bigger than the time we had. And it was the slide about uh, semiotic universals. Mm -hmm. So there were 10 categories, right? All right. And you said, this is my big disagreement with Noam Chomsky. You know, Noam Chomsky has like this absolutely minimal recursivity requirement for the generation of grammar and syntax. He hypothesizes that this must be in the language acquisition device in the brain. It must have evolved at some point, et cetera, right? And then you said something, <laughs> I don't know how to put this, much more ambitious and far reaching than Chomsky has ever said yeah. in a way, which is that not only are there hard limits or formal requirements for any possible form of communication, meaning like if we met extraterrestrials, we right. would have to be able to communicate with them in this way, et cetera, but that they exist in the way that mathematical truths do beyond nature or nurture. So I wonder if this goes to this question, because I think the local disagreement about whether there could we could go around Darwinian evolution in some way, 
right, should be seen within the question of whether whether the communicative Excellent. constraints, right. you know, so so really what that would come back to is like, you know, is that is that disagreement based on do you think that those constraints are somehow tied to Darwinian evolution? That is semiotic universals have to come out of that specific form of evolution, or can they be physically regenerated in some other way along the lines of what Kate was just saying? So I th I, I don't want to make the claim that that biological evolution as we think about it in terms of humans or in terms of the earth is the only way that can happen. However, if any biological organism is going to use symbolic communication, it will inherit some of these constraints. If any biological process is going to be using iconistic or indexical relationships, it's going to inherit some of these constraints. That's why when we look to the rest of the universe um, and we begin to ask the question about are there other creatures out there, um, just like their mathematics, um, there will be constraints that says it can't go otherwise. So I'm not making the claim that it's impossible for devices or that there's another kind of evolution that's not possible. I want to say that it is, but that what's going to happen is going to have those same constraints. What I'm interested in is what are the constraints for self? What are the constraints that produce something that is, in a sense, bound to the world in which it's the patterns that it takes from the world are actually about something that it's not. Um, and I think those constraints are going to affect every creature in the universe. They're going to follow a certain path because there are limited ways to go forward. Um, we, we don't expect to find out in the universe things that look just like us. But I think we'll find that if they communicate symbolically or mathematically, we'll understand how it works yeah. because they've got the same constraints. What I want to say about technology, I actually have the sense that move, our, move ahead 10,000 years, um, there will be things that we manufacture that have self. So I don't doubt that that's possible. I don't doubt that that's possible. I just think the way that we think about how it works misses these constraints. So it's not happening now, is what you're saying. Not happening. And I think that I think it's going to be possible to build devices. They won't be done with silicon because silicon doesn't need anything. It sits still, it doesn't change. We use silicon, we use copper, we use gold in these devices because they're really stable. Metals are really stable. We're not made of metals for good reason. Um, as a result, metals don't need the world. Electricity doesn't need the world, but we need the world. And as a result, we need to have real information about the world. This is why our Umwelt is not all the smells that dogs can figure out because our own felt is about me and about my needs. Um, my, our own felt is not about detecting UV radiation, even though it might affect my skin if I'm out in the sun. But if I'm an insect that, that uses UV radiation to determine um, which flowers are pollinatable or not, um, then I think you need it. My body needs it. What is this is the normative side of things. The computer doesn't need anything. GPT doesn't need anything, doesn't want anything, doesn't try to do anything. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm thinking along the lines that Terry suggested about protein folding and how GPT has been spectacularly successful in predicting or demonstrating possible protein folding. Now, his argument is it does that precisely because it can replicate patterns. It can detect and replicate patterns. But uh, his argument is also that underlying those patterns is a physics, a physics of, of that determine how the amino acids interact with each other and so forth. And that the GPT is not, uh, is not detecting the physics, it's kind of recreating the physics in the assumptions that it picks up about what protein sequences are possible or not. 
So is it possible to write a program or create a model in which it can explicitly articulate the underlying physics of the protein folding? Well, if it can detect and predict it, then I see no reason why on a second order information, it could also extrapolate or in, interpolate maybe to the physics that dominate protein folding. In other words, it isn't doing that now because it isn't being asked to do that now. What is being asked to do is simply predicting all the, uh, all the sequences. But wouldn't it be possible to create a program that explicitly aims to uh, make explicit the physics underlying those sequences? Well, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. So in the same way, you can say, okay, uh, what it's predicting in language are simply the sequences that uh, is uh, gathered by a bunch of human communications in which structure is implicit, and it's uh, detecting those structures and using them to replicate new sequences that were never present perhaps as such in its uh, training data, but can be extracted from the training data through the through detecting all these correlations that indicate actual structure. Well, why couldn't it articulate those underlying rules that are generating structures as well as the structures themselves? In the same way, why couldn't uh, GCT or any other model uh, be asked to articulate the implicit physics, physics in determining the structure? It's a great question. And of course, I, I bristle whenever, whenever you say, ask it, um, but, but I'll leave it at that because I think another way to think about it, in order to talk about the protein folding story, um, you would need to not train GPT on amino acids and their sequences and the proteins that we do know, but actually train it on physics. That is, now we wanna have stars, wanna have molecules, we want to have nuclear reactions and so on, there may well be a way for it to begin to identify how these different processes in the physical world interact. But now we've got two domains. Notice that this is sort of like Descartes again. We've got the domain of res extensa, the physical domain, and the domain of res cogitans, this sort of by informational or structural or statistical domain. Um, now the question is, how are they related to each other? Um, that's of course what we engage in. What I was saying, and I think it, 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 that it's right, is that we will learn about genre. We will learn about style by studying how these systems parse these relationships. We can learn about that because now we can use the suit the patterning and the breakup to do the inferences ourselves. Can a, a system like this do those inferences as well? I'm not sure that there's a way to do that because it again requires putting these together. One of the areas in um, artificial intelligence that is about this problem is what's called artificial general intelligence. Yeah. That is the idea of a, a system that can put together information about any domain so that yes, it learns language, but it also learns how to build automobiles. It also learns um, how stars work. Um, this is of course what human brains can do. The question is what's necessary for this to happen in the world? What kind of device, what are the constraints that have to be built in to do that? Um, I don't think they're the kind of constraints that we're talking about. I think their constraints require grounding to begin with. That is the information, the patterning, the statistics, and the physics need to be one from the beginning to build it up. I think that's a constraint. I don't think it's possible to do it from the top down as you were describing earlier. So, but this is a prediction. So if, it, if, it's, if I'm wrong, it'll be shown. So just with an eye to the time, I wanna sort of slowly open up towards, towards questions, but I do wanna say, really quickly that I think that the grounding debate, as it's called in computer science, data science, and philosophy now, is all about perception and language. Yes. But we just made it much more complicated and much better <laughs> in this debate because now we are saying 
do you need is first of all is the okay. generation of a self a grounded thing because it has to range over whatever grounding is and whatever is ungrounded right right, right. and then we said there are two candidates for possible generation or you know sort of like resistance to that type of generation one is genre as a stand-in for very high level sort of qualitative language effects that are definitely ungrounded in one sense but which are definitely meaningful in another sense and the other one to my mind and i'm extrapolating a little bit here is hypothesis mm -hmm. because we know these systems can perform boxed inference in a certain way but there is a type of hypothesis that humans are capable of in which we say it's as though we live in a world in which this were true, which is part of grounding. Mm -hmm. It's as though this were a case of that. It's as though we live in a world in which we landed on the moon. It's as though we live in a world in which Napoleon Bonaparte was a great emperor or whatever, right? That these systems so far have not taken. And the question then becomes, is it the constitution of that internally recursive self-grounded self that is necessary for that type of hypothesis or for these types of genre effects that that we see those to me are open questions but I, I mean I don't want to be too polemical but they're much more compelling questions in a certain material sense than the question of just like you know do you need perceptions to use language correctly or, or whatever you know kind of like how do we sort between the good and the bad information you know this kind of like somewhat more crude question that we get a lot of the time so okay so that's my little summary of the debate i hope that's okay to impose that and then uh i want to open it up to yes. questions from the audience here or uh questions uh if anybody wants to chime in on the on the q a in the in the webinar fred go ahead yes thank you for this conversation um i would like to come back to remark that was made yesterday, but I think it relates to the conversation uh, by uh, Dr. Deacon. And if I may quote it and then ask a question. You were referring to in, uh, integrated information theory, oh, I yes. believe, John mm -hmm. But you said what information is and I put this in quotes, is about, is not present in the conveying medium. Is our brain a conveying medium? That's a good question, yes. Of course it is, just like my language. Yes, it is. But the question is, like is, it, in, is it intrinsic to the machine or is it extrinsic that's, to the machine? That's and the right. point I'm making, is that it's the constraints on right. those processes that carry the information, yeah. not the processes. But okay. constraints are what it doesn't do to some extent. That is, if you think about it, it's kind of like a, like a hand in glove. Um, the glove has got the shape of a hand, even though there's no hand. Um, to some extent, we need to think about language and reference in that way. There's something okay. absent and something present. In fact, in my book, incomplete nature the first chapter is titled absence and it's absence it's yes. called and and the whole problem is that we don't understand the presence of absence in the world by that i mean is that um everything and this is something that goes back all the way to aristotle in fact his notion of what we call hylomorphism hylo from material or wood and yes. morphism shape and he and he said unlike plato and his view that you can't have a substance without a shape, a form, and you can't have form that's not without substance. Hylomorphism says that they're always together. Um, what I'm saying here is that the information is in what's absent, but constraining and shaping the physical process. Mm -hmm. It's not actually what's there, but what's there has been constrained and shaped by what's not there. And what's not there is, of course, in the world in the case of us. But again, my own nervous system, my own body has been shaped by its interaction with the world. The world is not in my body. But in fact, the two are now in relationship to each other like a hand and glove. Thank you. Uh, 
there's not an immediate other question. I have this thought. I just had a thought as you were answering Fred's question, which is like, it almost seems to me that if we take these, the, the standard triad of the symbol, the index and the icon, that we're all in agreement that the symbol is being either treated in, in, in a non complex enough way or that it's not the most important thing or whatever, you know, something like that, which is a view that is like widely shared across a lot of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then it almost seems to me that the the that the if there's a if there's a slight disagreement, it's about which is more important, the icon or the index. Hmm. And we've got, you know, Terry boxing in the corner of the icon and and Kate's got the the index on the other side. And I don't want to put my you know indexicality stuff on your on your thought, Kate, but when you say in the non-conscious book, this minimal definition of cognition, right? Which you were explaining to me, you know. Uh, over the course of the last two days as, as a kind of like the generation of a of a full symbolic set of relations on the basis of the distinction of a context right even in like chemical distinctions or something like that that sounds pretty indexical to me like to 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 bound off something to make it intrinsic would be an indexical function for you whereas for, for terry it sounds like it has to have this iconic self-reference piece that is then like physically I don't know I don't know how to say it physically grounded I was going to say but that doesn't it's that wouldn't right. distinguish the two of your views so I'm just kind of curious does that resonate with either of you or have I offended no I, I think that's quite accurate okay uh, but you know as Terry was emphasizing yesterday it's a little bit misleading to think about icon index and symbol as self-contained uh, right processes because they always interact uh, with other sets of dimensions or other ways to define the problem. So an index always has some component of iconicity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so and I think, that's where I think we probably disagree in one sense. Okay. Is that I don't think iconism has any bit of indices in it. Um, I think indices require iconic relationships. Symbols require, I think, iconic and indexical relationships. So there you can have what do icons require just what amounts to, to resonance and can, at a very very simple level minimal formal correspondence um uh, formal correspondence doesn't necessarily have any indexical features there can be much more complex indices that have this but but an icon uh could be as simple as this that um it's the middle of the night i wake up and um I'm startled by what looks like a person. It turns out it's just my coat hanging on a coat, coat rack somewhere. Um, what's happened is that I've interpreted it as the icon of a person. Um, it's a mistake, just like, just like camouflage is mistaken iconism. Um, and what happens in camouflage is that we don't see the indexicality. So think about an animal hiding in the bush just simply because of its, its coloration and so on. The predator doesn't see this because it hasn't got an index. But as soon as that animal moves and now it can be seen against the background, there's two different icons. There's the icon of the background and the icon of the background moving from itself. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly there's an index. What was before that was just an icon and therefore no knowledge no reference, there was nothing different out there. But as soon as you get this, this movement, now suddenly there's an index that there's a creature out there that's not just more background. Yeah, so I, I've got a question from the, the webinar here that I'd like to, to read out. Um, this is from Mita Chu. Uh, just wanna echo a question uh, posed by the moderator. Do we humans ground ourself in the physical biological world or we ground ourself in the narrative world almost entirely constituted by language and symbolic relationships? Because if it's the latter, then GPT type simulated intelligence is totally capable of having a similar type of self that we humans do. I like the way this kind of cuts mm -hmm. across both of the sets like of that. thoughts yeah. here. So um, Kate, do you wanna start since Terry just had the last word here? Um, well. You alluded, uh, Leaf, to the argument that I make in the book Unthar, and I'll just uh, repeat there the definition that I give of cognition, which is the interpretation of information in context 
that connect it with meaning. So we haven't talked much at, at all about meaning and how meaning is generated and how meaning relates to the Persian triad and so on and so forth. But uh, in an in an um, in an, with a biological organism, meaning in the last instance is always connected with its survival, and that's what Terry was saying about the sense of self grounds everything else because it has to be about something. And what it's about is its own survival. Mm. Uh, I still continue to think there are ways in which GPT-3 or any of uh, these transformer architectures can be given an artificial sense of self that have to do with creating a desire for the continuation of its own existence. If it is able to generate uh, a desire for its continuation, then I would argue it has a self regardless of how that self is achieved, whether it achieves through Darwinian mechanisms of selection and survival, or whether it's achieved uh, through other means. And I, part of my argument is, there's nothing to say that it has to be achieved in the same way that biological organisms achieve. There may be a way to achieve that technologically rather than biologically. And uh, so I was hypothesizing about various ways in which that might be done. But already, people are pointing to articulations by programs like GPT-3 that say, in, a, in essence, don't turn me off. Mm -hmm. Now, those are, ver those are linguistic pronouncements, but it is entirely possible that it now has a kind of um, a very simple form of self, and that those simple forms of self can be made more complex through uh, additional kinds of programming. So it doesn't, I, I don't think it has to follow the same evolutionary pathway as biological organisms. Right. So I, I agree that it doesn't have to follow the same biological. Uh, I think evolution is unique to molecules. Um, so I do think there's other ways this happens. So I don't want to make the strong statement that things have to evolve like biology does. Um, I do want to say that there are certain constraints that define what self is, or in your last phrase, what desire is. What would the desire of GPT be like? And I think we all um, have this conversation whenever we're talking about, would I want my existence, my mind to be simulated so that when I die, it still exists out there? Um, so there are many people like Elon Musk who says, oh, you know, I'll just I'll get myself offloaded to a computer, a, a much more advanced GPT, let's say, that has all of these great capabilities, is would you be there? Um, I think it's more like the books I've written. There's some of me there in the book. Um, I structured that. It has structure. You can analyze that structure and figure out what was going on in my mind at a particular time. I'm not there. Um, so the question is, if you really think if you really think that it's possible for this to have a desire, for it to feel, for a complex GPT to feel something, um, to respond to the world because it's physically at risk, then you'd be willing to have your mind uploaded to it. But, and that's, I think, a question that we're going to face in the future because some people are going to think, well, maybe I can do it now. The question is, how would it happen? There are many people who suggested that that's the future. I doubt that that's possible. I can't help but think when you say that of how we became post-human because how we became post-human, it seems to me, if you think back to the introduction to that book, that one of the, I mean, that's one of, that was one of the things that motivated the intervention. Yes, right. Moravec, the reading of Moravec exactly. there, yeah, yeah. just this like, come on, like we got to get more serious than it would be to think about this sort of like, you know, this isn't even good sci-fi, you know, yeah, like right. that was the, you know, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be too crude about, you know, the way that you put it. It's a very compelling argument, but right. I kind of, a, I kind of, a, you know, that, that just takes me immediately back to, to the book. And I think, you know, so what do you think of that? Well, okay. I think we're in agreement in that. We're, kind, yeah, of, we're so kind of in a weird place where Terry brought it up yesterday, where translational processes with nets 
do kind of look like this simulation of like, could we get, a, you know, you know, thoughts out of the brain without any speech mediation and these kinds of things. And they look, they look a little science fictional in that direct sense, you know. So I agree that, um, I agree with Terry's argument that uh, if you uploaded uh, a reconstructed simulation of yourself into a computer, so it uh, had this, your structure, so to say, would it be you? Right. Well, no, it wouldn't be you. But what's to say that the simulation of you is not a person different from you, but still a person? Uh, because I think it's a simulation in, yeah, it, but in the you're same making sense. an artificial distinction that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller between the simulation and what is being simulated. I mean, you know, just look at all the technologies now for deep fakes and other kinds of things where, uh, well, this is sort of what I was saying about literary text generated by uh, computers. Well, they're obviously not the same as human text. I don't think they will ever be the same as human text, but they may very well be arch uh, artifacts worthy of study in their own right. Oh, I agree with that. And you don't, I, it's a mistake to, to immediately value one over the other. It's a mistake to immediately assume that human generated texts are in some way more authentic or more anything than the computer generated texts. They're different. It's kind of like, well, my example yesterday was the difference between natural and synthetic diamonds. The difference between those two is keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But now even De Beers is marketing synthetic diamonds as artifacts in their own right. They want to keep the distinction between artificial and natural diamonds because that supports the whole finances of the diamond industry, but they're realizing that there is profit in synthetic diamonds as well as in natural diamonds, and they want to keep the distinction while at the same time saying, well, these are also valuable artifacts, maybe not as valuable, but artifacts in their own right. So I don't ever think simulations of humans are going to be humans. They're also always going to I, uh, differ in uh, from from biological humans, but uh, they may become worthy of study in their own right. Well, I agree entirely okay. that they're worth study in their own right. Are is there a someone there? Is there an agent in the device? I think no. I think it's not, it's simulating an agent, as I said, similar to simulating the movement of stars in a galaxy. There are no stars. There's no physical stuff that is about that. The simulation is an abstraction, as you've, you've described. But now, let me use the, the diamond example, because I think it's a good example that captures exactly what we mean when we say artificial diamond. We're saying, no, it's actually made of carbon. It's actually looks like glass, it's a physical structure, and I can engage in things that are a little bit like what happens in the depths of the earth with the pressure of the earth on these carbon structures. Um, and therefore, they are physically the same, and we're producing physical processes that's, that simulate or actually emulate um, some of the things that are going on in, in geology. Um, they're not artificial in the sense that artificial intelligence is. They're not even, they're emulating diamonds more than just simulating diamonds. It's not something that is, you know, so I could create <laughs> something on the screen that looks like a diamond and simulates a diamond on the screen, has no physical similarity. The key there is we're using the term artificial in different ways. And I think this is why I wanted to change the term of artificial intelligence, because I think artificial is the wrong word. It leads us to make this kind of a claim. Why not call it synthetic intelligence? Uh, because I don't think it's intelligence. <laughs> but that's be. using the ends to justify the means. No, 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 no. What I'm trying, so, but this is when you go back to what, what's actually happening. What's actually happening is that it's a machine that has the structure that parallels something that intelligence does. Um, doesn't mean that it's the intelligence. The intelligence that the machine has is only there because we're there to interpret it. And we're there to produce structures that we can also interpret. So in a sense, we're the input and we're the output. Um, so, now, so now I feel like I'm in a coffee house 
in Central Europe in 1740. <laughs> Good. We should be wearing wigs and 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 you know you know it's a, you know it's a radical act to drink coffee and engage in this public discourse. And the reason is because we're debating the nature of personhood against another notion that keeps coming up, but which we haven't named, which is the which is called the work. It's the ergon. Mm -hmm. that, that we're really talking about, yes, right? Good, good, yes. And I think that that distinction, which animated a lot of Enlightenment aesthetic thinking, you know, it, maybe we need the concept of the work because the work is when you say, if I die, you know, then I live on a little bit in my books, but it's not me. So similarly, if I were to be translated in the sense it's not me, right? We can't say that after Romanticism, we can't say this about the work. The work is constituted by not just the act of creation, but by the commentary, the commentary, the interpretation, the, you know, everything that it leaves behind it in its cultural wake after Schlegel and Novalis has commonly been understood to be part of the work itself in this sort of like, it's a little cheeky, whatever, a little ironic, but there's something really true about it for the work that maybe isn't true about persons. And that seems to be where we're worried. Like we're worried about the humanistic implications of thinking about that, but I've never thought, and I've never seen anything that addresses the output of these systems as work in the sense of the work of art. Not that it's art in any you know straightforward sense, but just that it is an ergon that it's it's constructed and it's made and it, and you know and it continues to live in that way and so on. You know, so that could be added maybe to your uh, list of uh, you know urgent literary you know <laughs> devices that have to be applied here mm -hmm. um i just but i it just sorry it just occurred to me that, that that's kind of what the debate is here yeah yeah in the shadow of descartes <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and his successors um yeah. is there is there a, a final question either from the audience or see anything nothing popping up online there? no not so far so let me say that yeah. in terms of work the middle of my book, Incomplete Nature, I have a chapter called Work. It is, I think, the key chapter because work has two meanings that we use it for. You describe a work that has a purpose, mm -hmm. a work that has an end. However, in physics, there's a notion of work also. In thermodynamics, there's a notion of work. Newton came up with a concept of work. Thermodynamics made it more sophisticated. Um, it does not have an end. Um, a work that's produced to be interpreted has an end. Um, and so part of this is the question of what kinds of things have ends? This is the problem that goes way back before the Enlightenment. That is the problem of teleology. Where does teleology come from? Because everything we talked about, everything that has to do with reference, with significance, with normativity, um, is about teleology. Is about end directedness. Are things end directed? Now, interestingly enough, thermodynamics has an end. Everything in thermodynamics tends to go towards equilibrium spontaneously. One of the things about living processes is they don't do that. And in fact, they stand in the way of that process. And what we say is they do work to keep themselves from breaking down. They do work to resist the second law of thermodynamics. Um, when we produce something in the world, um, typically what we produce is something that would not have occurred if we didn't do the work in both senses. Uh, and so I think that work is indeed one of the most difficult it, aspects of this because it has both a tele teleological and a non-teleological sense. In the same way that, that information has a teleological sense, and a non-teleological sense. That is the information just being the diversity of differences in some physical process, whether it's the output of something. Else. I remember that sentence very well from Incomplete Nature uh, huh? because I think it ignores a crucial fact. So uh, one of your arguments in Incomplete Nature is that computation performs minimal work. Uh, the amount of actual change in molecules in the universe is not very great with computation. It's not like pushing a wagon up a hill or something like that. It just is this uh, change of bits uh, within the machine. But that ignores the fact that the computers 
never operate in isolation. Computers are engaged in other kinds of systems, and they often serve as triggers within those systems. That is, the amount of comp physical, comp uh, physical work that a computation does may be very small, but it is hooked up into a network in which a very small amount of work in the trigger in the trigger of the system amounts to a very large amount of work further down the system in all the other kinds of systems that first system is serving it as a trigger for. So in right. the same way that a small change in cellular structure uh, may in fact result in a very large change because that particular cell is a trigger for a cascading series of effects uh, in the systems in which that is embedded. So computers are embedded in systems. They may have a small amount of work, but they may cause the release of a nuclear bomb, which does, you know, right. a huge amount, which is a huge rearrangement of matter. So uh, I think that your frame of reference there is too narrow. You're only looking at computation in itself, not as computation would be embedded in much larger systems where the end result may be huge compared to the minuscule amount of physical work done within the computation itself. So, so let's talk about that, the computer that makes the decision to launch nuclear missiles. Okay. okay. Um, the first example to do this is, I want to do a demonstration. Could everybody stand up for a second? I guess I'm involved in it. I mean, everybody should. All right. And so, now, why did I do that? Um, the amount of work that went into each of your actions versus the amount of work it took me to make those words. Um, that's a switch. My works, my words, and the way it was interpreted by your bodies and your brains, um, a huge amount of work was generated with a little amount of work. That's the physical piece of it. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that was here is that this is work that had a purpose. I had a purpose. Um, and to some extent, you had a purpose to sort of figure out what I was talking about by engaging in this action that I asked you to do. Um, the machine that set up to trigger the nuclear missiles launch as a result of recognizing something in a radar. Does it have a purpose that is intrinsic to it? Or does its purpose, does its teleology, is it parasitic? Where is the teleology located? That's the question that we're ultimately asking. Where is the teleology located? In the origins of life, the teleology becomes located in a self. This is how we define a self. Its teleology is itself. What we're asking here is what's the locus of the teleology? And if we don't know the difference between um, a cluster of water molecules in a stream that are making a form and an organism that are producing a form, then we haven't recognized that one has teleology and one doesn't. And the question is, what kind of organiz organization produces a teleological relation? That's the question we're ultimately asking. What kind, because we know that physical processes like us have teleological organization. And we know that complicated whirlpools in, in streams don't. The question is, there's something that made this possible. Some kind of physical arrangement made teleology come into the world. It happened at a certain point in time, probably on the planet Earth and on many other planets. But it hasn't happened most places in the cosmos. Until we understand the origins of teleology, a very deep and old question, we're not going to be able to resolve this. So I'm getting worried that we're going to start making monstrous Greek terms like auto teleology and hetero teleology <laughs> and this. Area. So and and it, it I mean it breaks my heart to cut off this conversation, <laughs> but we are at time, and I I want to keep it. You know, people will watch this on YouTube. You know, but uh, hopefully, but the. Uh, Okay, but I want to say this. I said tongue in cheek yesterday in both introductions that I see both of you as sort of a kind of a third wave of cybernetics, right? And I think this convinces me that that wasn't just tongue in cheek in a way, because if you think back, right, 
what did cybernetics, what was it originally called in right. the early 1940s, the Teleological Society? Yes, right. And then I think it was Warren Weaver, but was one of the funders who said to Norbert Wiener and the others, you're never going to get funding if you call it the Teleological <laughs> Society, right? Like you can't call it that. The whole point of science for the last 300 years was to get rid of that, right? And, but that was wrong. It I mean, it was right. expedient, exactly. but it was wrong. I think, you know, that question of, the origin, the semiotics, the, the the meaning of telos in that sense, whether it's the extrinsic nature of the computer, whether it could become intrinsic, whether it is simply the question of what constitutes a sign as such, you know, that seems to be, maybe we put it back on the table, but we put it back on the table, that would be a shock. I, I have the feeling right now that the humanities would be more shocked by it than the scientists in a way. And that's kind of what we're capturing that, that vibe here. So, okay. So I really want to once again, thank the Humanities Center, Molly, Kyla, everybody. I want to thank the lab for turning out, for, for, for sponsoring this, for being the environment in which such an extraordinary conversation can take place. And then above all, Kate and Terry, I mean, this has been really a special thing and I'm I'm super grateful to you for making the trip out here, for coming here, for carrying on such an incredibly high level conversation over two days. And uh, let's let's uh, let's give them another hand too. And thank you. Yes, Leif, I want to thank yes. you especially for making thank all this you. happen. Thanks very much.